Hi, good morning. My name is uh, Terry Capebread and I have the pleasure of hosting this uh, next session. And I'd like to introduce uh, Philip Ike, who's going to be talking about Steel Bridge Assessment. He's a, a senior account manager with Lucis, looks after Europe and his clients in the UK and South America as well. So I'll hand you over to Philip. Uh, thank you, Terry, and uh, good morning uh, again. Um, my presentation today will consider Steel Bridge Assessment and uh, covering two main topics. So, how to mitigate assessment failures by improving your modelling techniques and then the issue of uh, rehabilitation and retrofit where we're perhaps applying engineering techniques uh, beyond those that we use in our in our day-to-day -day work. Um, so turning to the four areas that I'd like to consider today, global models, distribution, buckling and local modelling. Um, starting with global modelling, first of all it's useful just to consider some of the main steel bridges that we might be looking at in assessment and these would include half-through girders, through trusses, half-through lattice girders, steel girders with steel composite deck, and steel girders acting compositely with a concrete deck. And the way that we analyse these could be very different. We don't have the time today to look at these in, in detail, but looking at some particular areas, if we take um, truss bridges where particular concerns um, exist in assessment, uh, it's useful um, to note that whilst these might be assumed pinned in ultimate limit state, we may need to consider some kind of moment resistance in the connections for our serviceability and fatigue calculations if they're appropriate. We'll also talk a little bit later on about local modelling for gusset plates um, in some more detail. So looking at uh, some global modelling techniques, we discussed structural idealisation earlier on. Um, here is an example from Benesh in the United States, mixing shell elements in the deck with beam elements in the truss members. And we have a similar modelling technique to this rather attractive bridge, the Ontonagon River Bridge, by the same consultant. Looking then at uh, half-through girders, a very different approach in this case is normally appropriate. The interaction between the main girders and the cross girders being particularly important in this instance. So here we may model this uh, using shells for the main girders. We could use shell models for the cross girders as well. Um, but a beam analogy could be sufficient where we could also pick up some uh, partial moment fixity using joint elements at their ends. Moving to curved and skewed structures, here bracing is particularly significant on the behaviour of the structure and how load is distribu distributed through it. Um, this is a particular study for the US Department of Transport where bracing and its consequent effect on load distribution in fact changed bearing capacity, bearing loads rather, by up to 15%. Grillage modelling of course is not so able to pick up these effects as it's not such a rigorous method. Um, torsional warping is also something that we should consider and that torsional warping is illustrated figuratively here where we have the axial components um, the uh, vertical moment, transverse moment, and obviously the warping separated out. And there are guidelines on how to deal with these. This one is from the United States Bridge Design Specifications, and it says, frequently the torsional warping degree of freedom is not available in beam elements, so the finite form element method may be, may be more appropriate, and a variety of elements should be used in this type of model. So here is an example of one such model where we have shell elements representing the deck structure. We're using shells as well to represent the webs, but in this instance using beam elements to represent the flange and stiffness. We could equally use shell elements in those areas, um, but assuming here that plain sections should remain plain, the beam analogy is, uh, is perhaps sufficient. And then finally, we're also representing the uh, bracing elements with, uh, with beam elements. So here we are adapting, adopting the ASHTO recommendation previously mentioned. Yeah. 
Uh, the UK Bridges Board um, produces this highly regarded inspection manual and allows us to also consider corrosion, which we have to, it's an important part of assessment work, and allows us to classify our corrosion in severity indices two, three, and five. But then how we should apply these to our models is not altogether clear. It's worth noting that for corroded sections, the load distribution is often not greatly affected, the overall depth of the section obviously not being affected by the corrosion on the perimeter. We could also adopt the approach that of performing an initial calculation to see what the resistance of the steel members is, assuming uncorroded uh, sections, because of course if uncorroded sections are already inadequate, um, then any assumptions for uh, corrosion loss becomes academic. But when we've taken a good global approach and we've dealt with corrosion as best we can, where do we turn next in our modelling methods? So here again we turn to a guideline document, the European Commission guideline document, which states that if the ULS is insufficient, if the resistance in ULS is insufficient, it is likely that allowing for plastic deformations will give us a more favourable answer. And they're recommending us to pursue a finite element approach which may cap capture possible failure modes. Um, so moving on then to moment redistribution. And here we have the guidelining, uh, gu European guideline continuing. If one or more of the cross-sections are non-compact, the deformation capacity of the plastic hinges has to be considered. This deformation capacity depends on the slenderness of the web and the compression flange. And this can be achieved by modelling the girder sections using shell elements or a mixture of beam and shell elements as described earlier. And we have the top graph here. Um, describing to us how rotation occurs in the formation of a plastic hinge. And our typical nonlinear uh, steel material model, used in conjunction with an appropriate modelling technique, which allows through section plastification, can enable this kind of behaviour to be studied as necessary. Considering buckling, it's helpful just to recall some basics. Here we have um, Euler buckling curve. This shows us. Um, the theoretical load due to instability, elastic instability of the member, considering no imperfections in the member. And we remember, of course, that in stocky members, that it is um, failure occurring by yielding rather than by buckling. We also remember that these are upper bound theorems. The real failure load for any strut on this slenderness graph would be some way below these theoretical curves. And the design codes inevitably are written in order that the design curve is conservatively below this real failure curve in accordance with some reliability index. In the Eurocode, for example, clause 6.3, which has been summarised here, has member resistance calculated by using the elastic critical buckling force or moment. That's the Euler value that we saw previously. And that allows us to determine a, a slenderness parameter which is ultimately used to give us a safe design value. So we can use FV analysis to help us identify the elastic critical force or moment, this identifying a value on the red line, and using the Euro code that can be converted to the design value on the blue line. Perhaps good enough for design, but over conservative for assessment. The alternative then is to adopt a full nonlinear approach, incorporating both geometric and material nonlinearity. And that's demonstrated here, where black stars are demonstrating the plastic yield, uh, plastic hinge of the steel material. The UK Highways Agency Assessment Code, BD 5610, while including some useful options for historic bridges, generally refers to the old. BS5400 design rules, essentially those curves that are familiar to us. The problem is that when it comes to buckling, codes of practice, whether they're British, European or any other, 
are generally conservative, having been written with the intention of being used on a variety of structural forms, and furthermore, not being written with assessment in mind. In a paper presented at the Institution of Civil Engineers, Eurocode launch of November 2010, engineers concluded that, for the beam studied, significantly higher capacity than that determined by codes of practice was available. Taking the outgoing BS5400 methodology, and as compared on this chart here, we can see that using the eigenvalue approach, the Eurocode approach, um, increases in strength were of the order of 50%, whilst moving to full nonlinear analysis, strength benefits of 100% were observed. It's also worth mentioning um, that BS5400 does itself have a relatively lesser known clause, 9.7.5, which does allow you to use an eigenvalue buckling moment similar to the Eurocode. And this could, of course, have some benefit to you in your assessment work. Coming back to half-through girders, as these offers suffer from low assessment ratings, this was the subject of another paper, uh, this time from the International Bridge Management Conference of 2005, where engineers from Gifford, uh, now part of the Ramble Group, applied a range of methods, including nonlinear analysis, to save some bridges which had been identified as substandard and concluding that nonlinear analysis gave them a significant increase in load carrying capacity. They also wrote that a restraint associated with the in-plane shear stiffness of the bridge deck exists in all half-through deck girder analysis. And this can be used through nonlinear finite element analysis to significantly increase bridge strength assessments. The restraint, which does not rely on moment continuity with a deck and is currently not recognised by design and assessment codes of practice, has now been applied in these bridges. So there is clearly a considerable amount of benefit to be gained in improving the structural idealisation that we use, together with the non-linear materials that we may select. So moving now on to uh, local modelling, and we're moving to a slightly different form of assessment here, catastrophe, um, but it needs to be mentioned, uh, we talk about saving structures, uh, after all, and saving lives, uh, hopefully. Um, so following this particular disaster um, in the United States, which were due, identified in the assessment report based on these nodal locations, these gusset plates um, within the steel bridge structure. Well, there were assessments in the early days, visual assessments, and in those assessments, this is one of the nodes that was identified as failing, and we can clearly see what is going on in this area of the structure. But this was not picked up. In fact, the accident report tells us that the collapse is not related to structurally deficient condition rating and otherwise corrosion. Um, it wasn't actually related to fatigue cracks. They were there, but it wasn't the mechanism for failure. In fact, the actual cause was inadequate load capacity due to design, area, uh, design error within those nodes. And the response, obviously, from the Federal Highways um, Authority was severe on this and forced a reassessment of all similar structures in the US um, to ensure that such failures did not, would not reoccur. And US consultants such as Gannett Fleming in the US have therefore been using shell models to determine the capacity of these gusset plate connections, understanding their likely modes of buckling failure. And in connection behaviour as well, finite element modelling can be used to study all kinds of connection details, giving good correlation with test results. Here we see moving from shell to volume modelling. Um, of these bolted connection forms. And not just that, but also as part of a larger assessment and rehabilitation project, this one being again from the Ramble Group, the Forsmo Crossing in Denmark. So finally in this presentation I'd like to move on to rehabilitation and retrofit, where careful analysis should enable engineers to deal with those issues that they're not using within design codes.
One area that I'd like to cover here, slightly different, is high-speed rail dynamics or general rail dynamics um, in structures. Um, with the explosion, really, of high-speed rail lines globally, there is a need not just to build new structures, but also to adopt existing stock. And to this end, we simply have to assess these existing structures for loads that they were never designed for in the first place. Um, the project that you see here is actually a new design, but the principles still hold. We could adopt a full time-stepping analysis in this analysis, uh, in this model, um, to assess the behaviour of the structure, but that's rather punitive in terms of the modelling techniques that we have to define uh, with ranges of speed and uh, processing time and solution. So it is rather um, preferable to move to modal solutions where using modal superposition methods we can identify a range of speeds and similarly identify the critical speed and uh, criteria such as displacement, velocity and acceleration around our bridge structures and then assess those obviously in accordance with our guidelines. Now such a um, uh, with such structures we can also model in greater detail. We could, using a finite element model, incorporate um, other structural forms, the ballast for instance within the deck, um, even the rail structure as has been done here, and the bearings within, uh, within this particular half through girder. And on a similar theme, in the USA, we have this bridge investigated by URS. A truss bridge where the lateral bracing showed what I think you'll agree is rather excessive vibration, especially if you're the man standing on the side. Now in this instance, fatigue cracks were found in the gusset plate and it was necessary to consider ways of arresting this problem. Based on in-service monitoring correlated to finite element analyses, retrofit solutions could be suggested. The simple solution in this case was to fit ties into the structure, thus increasing the natural frequency and avoiding those resonance issues. And finally, it's almost a complete side really, thermal analysis. So here we're looking at um, a girder which has suffered impact damage. Uh, this was also considered in a, in a paper, this one in the IC proceedings of March 2006. In this case, the modeling method is volumetric. Um, initially to assess the stresses in the girder, but also to model, it, model the heating process as the girder was straightened. So just adding to the possibilities there, we've looked at uh, linear static models, non-linear models, um, we've considered dynamic modelling, but here we're looking at uh, thermal behaviour as well, and this is something we'll hear a little bit more about in the, in the concrete session. But that wraps up um, what I'd like to talk about in terms of retrofits which uh, just leads me to uh, summarise to you. We would encourage you that we can represent the behaviour of structures very well using a mixture of appropriate finite elements, um, uh, finite elements in your structure. We can assess the capacities with moment distribution, understanding load paths and uh, getting closer to accurate buckling analyses. And if need be, we can move on to further detail, local analysis, understanding connection details, for instance, and moving on to dynamic and thermal effects. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, has anybody got any questions?